Well, let's continue our discussion right now with our panel. Joining us from Boston, Kave Afrasiabi is a political scientist and co-author of Trump and Iran, From Containment to Confrontation. Mazin al Isheka joins us from Baghdad. He's an economist and independent politician. With us here in Washington, Hafed al Gawal is non-resident senior fellow at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And from New York, Mike Lyons is the non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point. Welcome to all of you to the show. Mazin al Isheka, let me start with you in Baghdad. We had this late breaking news on Wednesday afternoon about these rocket attacks uh, in the green zone. We just heard about it from our reporter as well. Can you give us some idea uh, of what's going on there? How tense is the city right now? Um, well, in my case, it's good morning to everyone. Um, it is pretty tense, actually. Uh, there are pl uh, parts of Baghdad that people cannot go to. They are blocking off some sections of Baghdad. It's m mainly around the green zone, like you said. Um, there is tension because uh, most of these people are living very close to each other. Whether they are pro-Iran or anti-Iran, they're all cuddled within this area called the green zone. So it could be one neighbor to another. Um, what I've heard, and I'm not sure if it's true or not, but the leaders of some of those militias uh, are, are now fleeing the country. It's not confirmed, but I've heard it from uh, many sources. So it sounds like uh, the, the target of, of, of uh, the U.S. now is uh, moved from, you know, Qasem Soleimani to the leaders of Iran's proxy in Iraq. All right, Mike Lyons, let's talk about the events of the past 24 hours. Lots happening, a very quick moving story this is. Uh, as our reporter told us, President Trump has decided on uh, the softest approach, the softest response to the Iranian missile attacks. Uh, what do you make of it? I, I think it's the right move. I, I don't want to see any more escalation, actually. I think what the president did, though, was establish a new level of strategic deterrence against Iran, and that's a decapitation. I think going after General Soleimani like he did uh, sends a very strong signal to the Iranians that uh, no American lives will be spared uh, in, in the future with regard to if, if someone is killed, um, I, we're going to go right after their leadership. Maybe that's perhaps why some of those leaders are leaving uh, Baghdad right now. But um, I'm not sure we're going to go on, uh, let's say, uh, a mission to go find ones that are remaining. But I do think that, uh, that the United States is going to tie those militia groups closely to Iran. And they're going to think if there's any kind of conspiracy whatsoever, they're not going to let Iran off the hook there. So they're going to expect Iran to get some of those groups uh, under wraps pretty quickly. And, and try to at least get to a place where perhaps we can have those diplomatic talks that your reporter was talking about. Kaveh Afrasiabi, is this uh, going to act as a deterrent, as Mike Lyon says? I doubt that, because uh, if the assassination of General Soleimani was meant as an act of deterrence, we have seen the blowbacks and how it has uh, backfired in the face of the Trump administration, uh, which was terribly humiliated yesterday uh, when the Iranians fired two dozen missiles at two U.S. military bases. And after that, all that hoopla about, you know, retaliating disproportionately hard and fast, uh, President Trump had to bite the bullet and uh, come and, you know, claim that Iran is a standing down just uh, right after being hit by the Iranians. So th despite the fact that there were no American casualties, and that was incidentally intentional on the part of Iran, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, Iran has stood up to the U.S., has, in the words of the Supreme Leader, given a big slap to the U.S. superpower, and the U.S. has not responded out of fear of repercussions, not just in Iraq, but in the wider region, because Iran gave a stern warning to the U.S.'s allies that if any of them give assistance to the U.S., they'll be targeted. Yeah. And so uh, as a result of which, you know, we see a major strategic setback for the U.S. to the benefit of Iran and, uh, you know, larger resistance movement against U.S. power. Hafid, we're seeing a bit of uh, a war of words right now. The rhetoric has taken over. Each side wants to portray itself as being the victor in this dispute. Just a few days ago, President Trump was talking about massive retaliation if Iran attacked any U.S. forces or U.S. assets in the region. Uh, but now, both sides seems, both seem to have stepped away from the brink right now. They're talking de-escalation. Which is the right move. I mean, um, it, the consequences of a confrontation are absolutely enormous. Um, and I think uh, that's why you see uh, countries like even Saudi Arabia or Israel or others 
uh, are calling for calm because mm -hmm. Iran is just a, a massive, massive um, weight in the region. And even if you defeat it, the logic is it will sink everybody around it. I mean, it's not something that you can get away with easily. I think uh, the, the issue from my perspective is I fail to see how the president uh, still would like to start a negotiation with Iran. Um, he's been offering that for a long, long time. Iranians have not responded. I fail to see that bombing them or killing their top generals is going to make them, is going to give them any more incentive to do more. Um, I think, personally, I think the move against Soleimani was um, a major uh, failure of U.S. policy. Um, and I don't see how it's going to be helping uh, in, in engaging Iran in any useful political process. When you talk about horrific <laughs> consequences, if there is a war between the United States and Iran fought in the Middle East, what kind of consequences are we talking Across about? Across the region. I mean, yeah. we saw that what happened after the U.S. invaded Iraq yeah. and how that unleashed all kinds of chaos that we're still paying a right. price for until today. Imagine a country that is a much larger weight and right. has uh, extensions. I mean, there are Shias in practically every country in the region. People concentrate on Lebanon. Uh, but no, it's not just mm -hmm. Lebanon. You have in Lebanon, you have in Yemen, Houthis. You have also massive and very large populations across the Gulf, from Saudi Arabia to the Emirates to Kuwait. Um, Iraq is now majority Shia. Right. Uh, so is Lebanon, if you, depending on how you calculate the population. Um, Syria has a, a large number of Shia. So uh, if, if you end up, and especially the way the, the president acted by killing not only Soleimani, but killing a major Shia yeah. leader in Iraq, you end up with a confrontation not with Iran, but you end up with a confrontation with all of Shias across uh, the region and the world. Mike Lyons, uh, Hafid al Gawal raises a great point there. What did the assassination of General Soleimani achieve as far as the United States is concerned? Uh, well, first of all, he wasn't assassinated. He was a military target. He was a foreign inside of Iraq planning for attacks on American forces there. So mm -hmm. the reality of the situation was it's uh, from a New York, from a, a legal perspective, uh, Geneva War uh, Convention as well as uh, warfare, modern warfare, he is uh, a military target. So that's number one. Number two, um, again, the United States is not looking to hunt down individuals within the Iranian military and, and to kill them. That's not the objective here. The objective here is to establish a baseline for actions that but Iran isn't that does what they've that just will done? get a response. Mike, isn't that what they've just done? They've, they've gone after an individual who's Iranian, an Iranian military commander, and killed him. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, he was a military target that was conducting a military operation against military forces, uh, mm -hmm. of which were Americans, inside of a place, inside one of our allies, and that's Iraq. So uh, we and can look, cavil, we can have rhetoric, one we can moment, have rhetoric Kyle, about... Yeah, go ahead, we could, Mike. We can, we can, uh, the rhetoric, again, let's you, as your point, is, is red hot right now. But the yeah. bottom line is this. We've, Iran has been at war with the United States for 40 years. This administration is finally waking up to it and, making, and understanding that we're establishing a very uh, large line in the sand with regard to actions from the Iranian government for what they do, and that is American deaths. And okay. if there are American casualties in these situations, they're going to see a response. The, re the response will also be not proportional. It won't, we won't be looking to pick off certain, certain things. We're going to go specifically, in my opinion, after um, key Iranian leaders that, who have made the decision to attack American forces. Okay. Uh, Kaveh, I'll get to you. Hafid, you want to say something? I, I just want to say that today, for example, in the briefings in Congress, some of the uh, uh, leaders of Congress came out saying the administration did not provide any serious evidence that Soleimani was engaging in any acts of terrorism yeah. or planning any concrete uh, acts mm -hmm. against the United States. Uh, uh, you know, and he was targeted uh, at an in Baghdad airport, ironically. I mean, as, as he was, um, I don't know if he was arriving or leaving. He was that, leaving, yeah. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a clear assassination. Uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't dispute that at all. Okay, Kabe, go ahead. Well, it's unfortunate that your guest doesn't see the, the fire, let alone the smoke. Or, you know, the Iraqi prime minister has repeatedly clarified that General Soleimani was there on an official visit, was on his way to his office, 
together with some of the uh, Iraqi military officials mm -hmm. who are part of the Iraqi government, who were also assassinated in cold blood in an act of war by the U.S. rogue, rogue government. And this, uh, you know, uh, make-believe imminent threat attributed to Soleimani simply doesn't watch because he came with a chartered plane with his own passport as a diplomatic envoy in response to the U.S. getting the prime minister of Iraq involved as an intermediary between U.S. And, and Iran, and Prime Minister feels betrayed by the U.S., and he has said so on several occasions already. So this whole U.S. justification that was an imminent threat and it was there to, you know, do this and that has absolutely no shred of reality about it, and those who repeat it are just, you know, uh, being the mouthpieces for a very rogue behavior that lacks legitimacy in the eyes of international law and so on. General Salamali was actively involved in the attack that took place on the U.S. Embassy uh, in Baghdad over the weekend. If there's one thing the United States is not going to tolerate going forward, it's attacks on its embassies. That's why troops have been deployed to Kuwait. There, we'll no longer have that mission. We'll no longer have what happened in February of 1979 when the Iranians took over uh, the American Embassy in Tehran. We won't have another Benghazi. It's not going to happen. So the bottom line was that general officer was as responsible for that attack as anybody else was. It was a military operation. He was not assassinated. But, Mike, if we look you at the big... You to believe your own lies. Go ahead. If I can jump in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Mazen. Um, yes, you know what? Uh, there's a, yet another country is taken hostage by their leaders who are trying to uh, join the nuclear club. You know, we know what happens to Saddam Hussein right here in Iraq. You know, the destruction that happened in this country, billions of dollars were wasted and the people were, were, were fil you know, filthy poor uh, in North Korea. I, I feel sorry for my neighbors in Iran who are taken hostage by their government just because they want to get a nuclear bomb. Whether, you know, uh, General Soleimani was criminal or not, that's something that has to be settled between the United States and Iran. And please spare Iraq this war. We've had so many wars in the past and we just want to live in peace. But yes, Muslim I know that. You say, you say the Iranian people have been taken hostage by their government. If we look at the demonstrations that took place in the aftermath of General Soleimani's funeral, it didn't look like the Iranian population were upset with their government. There was a massive outpouring of anger and grief. Uh, yeah, for this person, yeah, they probably uh, have taken him to a, a higher stage. Um, they've glorified him because he's a, you know, a, a, a general who has won some battles for them. But, uh, you, know, you know, all the sanctions on Iran and, you know, their, uh, the amount of oil they've been producing and exporting is a lot less than before. So we've seen this, uh, this story. We've seen this film before um, in North Korea. So, you know, I, we want to live in peace here. And then for your guest who was saying that, uh, that when you attack Iran, you should expect the Shias around the Middle East to, to, um, um, to uh, fight back. Uh, first of all, the ones who uh, have sent their condolences was uh, uh, the people in Hamas, uh, in Gaza Strip. They're not Shia. And Taliban also send their condolences. They're not Shia either, as well as the Muslim Brotherhood. So, you know, when you see the list of condolences they're receiving, it didn't come from Shia population. In fact, the Shia oh, really? population in Lebanon Ayatollah and Sistani's Iraq... Ayatollah representative is not Shiite? Yeah, he is Shia, because that is, is okay. his, his, you know, his role as his eminence. But the Shias of Iraq have been demonstrating against their corrupt leaders who are mostly Shia, as well as the Shia of Lebanon have been demonstrating against their corrupt Shia leaders. So the Shia, we are not, uh, you know, blindfolded to only follow Iran. Actually, we actually think and we choose whether uh, the leader is corrupt or not corrupt. I, th Go ahead. I, I think, uh, you know, your guest, um, unfortunately, is misreading. I said that when you attack also an Iraqi Shia leader, um, you have uh, an, uh, 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 essentially expanded your confrontation. Well, it's not about Soleimani or Iran. You also, it was in response that Iran can use a lot of its leverage around the region, as it showed yeah. over the last few years, in, for example, in Yemen, as it shows until today through Hezbollah. The point, however, that I think is important is where does Iraq fit into this picture? I think now you're seeing a confrontation beginning on a proxy between the United States and, and Iran on Iraqi soil. Uh, and I think that is the very explosive uh, part. 
there is also a cost that the United States has incurred, uh, incurred uh, already, and that is when the Iraqi parliament and government asked officially for U.S. troops to be withdrawn from Iraq. I think that's a loss for the United States. And Mike, uh, can I? Can I? Sorry, I'll, I'll get to you, uh, Kaveh. Uh, Mike Lyons, uh, the Iranians have said that that is their ultimate goal, to get the United States expelled from Iraq. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a very small footprint in Iraq. The, for all practical purposes, the United States left in 2011 under the previous administration. Yeah. The footprint in Iraq is about 5,000 soldiers, airmen doing various things, assisting the Iraqi government. They, have, they pose no threat to Iran on any level. They're helping to fight uh, terrorist organizations that are inside of Iraq, helping the Iraqi government. They pose no threat to Iran uh, at, at all. And the embassy is there to help the Iraqi government get stood up as well, right. bring business, bring not bring democracy, but bring, bring capitalism, bring companies to Iraq. I know many people that are trying to do this. The, the, the military there the, on the ground does not threaten Iran at all. Now, that's not to say the Navy doesn't and the Air Force and the strategic weapons don't. don't. But the bottom line is you won't see large formations of U.S. troops, I don't think, return to the Middle East in my lifetime or the lifetime of anybody on this panel. The, go ahead. I, I'm just sorry, but the point is not whether the, 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 pop, the embassy or whatever troops are there are what they are doing, whether they're helping Iraq or not. The point is the United States lost in that sense, because now the population of Iraq is demanding that whatever the United States presence is, it can be just there to, to cheer the Iraqis. So you're saying politically, need, symbolically, absolutely. it's a loss for absolutely. the United States? Because what about that, Mike? Is it a loss? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm willing, we have to see whether or not that's the case. Uh, I, I don't want to get into Iraqi politics, but it was not, uh, it, I'm not sure there was even a quorum there. Yeah. There's lots that can dispute whether or not that was actually a vote. I, I understand how they have to vote, and that's the politics side of it. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at it from the military perspective. The bottom line is the troops that are there are on the side of the Iraqi security forces, helping them fight terrorism. You bring in U.S. intel, bringing all of the different re resources and power, soft power that the United States has to help the Iraqi government. They're not, a, they're not a fighting formation on any level. Kavi, go ahead. You wanted to say something. Well, I thought that what President Trump said today about cooperation between Iran and the U.S. against ISIS and also mentioning uh, other shared priorities was rather significant. And if President Trump is really serious about that, then that is the basis for uh, you know, new venue for diplomacy and dialogue between the two countries, because there are all kinds of reports that ISIS is regrouping. There's actually a new report by Pentagon that there are some 18,000 ISIS fighters in Iraq and Syria causing mayhem, and this threat will only grow in the, in the future, particularly now that the uh, U.S.-led coalition has stopped its fight against ISIS. So there really needs to be a singular focus on the threat of ISIS, and that could be the basis for dialogue between the U.S. and Iran. That's right, Marzen, isn't it? Uh, General Soleimani uh, played a key role in the defeat of ISIS in Iraq. Now that he's gone, is there any likelihood that ISIS could make a return, could be strengthened? Well, you know, he was a great general. He helped the Iraqi people, the Iraqi army uh, on the ground. Of course, the Iraqis are also grateful to the United States for helping uh, fight ISIS in the air. So we had help from Iran on the ground and from the United States on the air. But, you know, uh, the whole war was not fought by one person. Uh, it's, in fact, it's the Iraqi soldiers who gave 41,000 um, uh, soldiers who died fighting ISIS. Yes, he was critical because he had st straight links to the leadership in Iran, and he could mobilize a lot of units uh, in, in a very fast manner. Iraq obviously paid for all these services. It didn't come from, for free. Um, uh, the, the general was, was extremely uh, important for building up the PMUs, the Popular Mobilization Units. Those, those PMUs were formed to fight ISIS. Yeah. Well, now that ISIS is defeated, Iraqis are saying, why do we still have the PMUs? And that, this is the question that people are saying, these, these are no longer PMUs, they might be Iranian proxies, and they might be doing the bidding for another country. So we have a problem with that. We want to keep Iraqi sovereignty, whether it's from Iran or the United States or any, any other countries. Uh, we obviously need the help uh, to fight ISIS uh, on the ground and in the air, but without uh, overriding the, the will of the people. The will of the people is demonstrating against the corrupt government, which is affiliated with Iran strongly. 
Michael Lyons, going to your earlier point about uh, the United States having a very small footprint in Iraq right now with about 5,000 troops there. Uh, in the wake of uh, the attack on the embassy as well as the assassination of General Soleimani, um, President Trump has dispatched thousands more troops uh, to the Middle mm -hmm. East. Is there a risk here of this phenomenon known as mission creep? No, they're, they're going to go to Kuwait. They're going to be a standing rapid deployment force. The, the kind of troops they're sending, the 82nd Airborne, this is what they do for the United States. And they'll be there standing by in case there's other embassies in the region that need help. Again, making sure that we don't have a repeat of what happened in Benghazi a few years ago. Um, the, the other issue, too, is we have helicopters. We do have some combat weapons that would have been employed. General Miley himself said, had the protesters gone any further, they would have run into a buzzsaw. So, th again, the bottom line is this. The United States does not want war with Iran yeah. on any level. The United States wants compliance, though. The United States wants peace in the region. The United States wants a strong Iraq. They want a strong Iraq as a partner, and they're going to continue to work in that direction. That's not the way to Arfa, do it. do you think that the presence of all these United States troops in the region will contribute to stability? No. Or will it be something else? No. I think history provides us with a very clear evidence that every time the United States uh, entered into the Middle East, uh, chaos ensued, um, more instability, more divisions, more terrorists showing up. Uh, and, and like now, I mean, the fact that the Iraqis are now uh, demanding that U.S. presence leaves, that's going to be an opening for ISIS again. Um, the United States is going to lose uh, one of uh, very important tools in its fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, and, and Syria, both because the Iranians, as you pointed out, the leader who's been fighting and supporting the United States in the fight against ISIS yeah. has been eliminated. Uh, and also because now there is a backlash against the United States in Iraq to force it out. Other leaders also around uh, the region who may have cooperated with the United States to fight against ISIS will see an example, will, will take what happened to Soleimani yeah. as a precedent that they may be targets okay. as well if the United yeah. States wants to send a message. And we have to leave it there. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.